Hi everybody, it's Susie Singer Carter and I just wanted to take a minute to tell you about a wonderful product I just discovered. It's called Sociavi. And Sociavi in Latin means to share and unite. It is the simplest way for older adults and people with disabilities to connect and engage with their family and friends. There's no username, no password, no login, and no app to choose from. It's just a dedicated device. It's the Sociavi C2M Connect to Me device that's always on and ready to use. And families and caregivers just install the app on their smartphone. And then you can just begin sending photos, videos, and even have live to live video chats. And your loved ones, they don't have to do anything. They just love it. And because all of us must fight elder abuse and work together to bring awareness to this issue, Sociavi is supporting my efforts to produce my vital documentary, No Country for Old People. When you subscribe to Sociavi for your loved ones, they will donate the payments received and you can help us reach our goal while connecting with your loved ones in the simplest way. Sociavi Connecting Generations Made Simple Globally. To learn more, please visit their website at www.sociavi.com. And when choosing the payments, select the annual subscription. The proceeds will go to help the production of our documentary, No Country for Old People, and I thank you so much. When the world has got you down and Alzheimer's sucks. It's an equal opportunity disease that chips away at everything we hold dear. And to date, there's no cure. So until there is, we continue to fight with the most powerful tool in our arsenal, love. This is Love Conquers Alls, a real and really positive podcast that takes a deep dive into everything Alzheimer's, the good, the bad, and everything in between. And now, here are your hosts, Susie Singer-Carter and me, Don Preece. Hello, I'm Susie Singer-Carter. And I'm Don Preece, and this is Love Conquers Alls. Hello, Susan. Donald, hello. Yes. Hello. You know, it's interesting. I think this, if, if you watch our episodes in order, you will find that our last three episodes, your background just keeps changing. That's the kind of girl I am. I like variety. Yeah. Yes. It looks delightful. You like this background? It, it's real. It's I not virtual. It's, it is real. It is yeah. real. You could stand up and, and touch it, but uh to do there's there the, it is. yeah. And yeah. I've I've put our I've I've put our illustrious awards. Do you see Look our awards? That. Fabulous. And uh the my mom and the girl poster. My mom and the and, girl poster over there. And and delightful pictures. I have behind me have a mirror and a lamp. And, and a bathroom it. door. A bathroom door. And then a little picture there, I think. So yeah. mine's not as exciting as yours. That's How okay. are you? You're, you're exciting. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm good. Uh, I'm very good. We're talking yeah. about, you know, t- we're, we're deep in, in the trenches of, of, of the documentary, No Country for Old People. And, you know, more and more and more and more as we're editing the, the, the concept of ageism is at the forefront of all the problems of every single problem that's going on you know it's all occurring because of ageism right it absolutely i mean you see it even in you know I, 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 we always talk about you know the, obviously the documentary we're doing right now no country for old people but you see it in you know we're trying to raise money for this it's the hardest thing we've ever done because people the ageism comes and they want to close their eyes to it. They don't want to hear about it. And that's, to me, that's a sign, a huge sign of ageism because they feel, oh, it doesn't affect me. It's, or I just don't want to hear about it. Blah, 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 la, 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 la. And I think that's, that's so telling, you know, as to what our society looks at, at the people, you know, uh, who we should be revering. And not oh, hiding. we have to revere them all because some of them are not. No, there. only those who are cool. <laughs> <laughs> only just the nice old cool. people. <laughs> yeah. There's not the yucky old people, just the nice old people. Yeah, we don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. um, no, but I'm just saying, like, just do, you know, as I'm as I'm, you know, organizing all of our research and, and trying to 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 put this puzzle together and you keep going how is this happening like it's so egregious and then and you really comes down to the fact that people are just not paying attention to what's going on and um 
our guest that's coming up today, she's been talking about this for this past decade. She's amazing. And she's, you know, you're going to introduce her, but I, 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 she is preaching our word and singing to the choir and, but doing it much more eloquent, eloquent, ah. eloquently. That's the word. Just like that. <laughs> just like that. Like Dawn just did. And but elegantly too. I think you kind of crossed them. Elegantly. Elegantly yes. and eloquently. Both those E words. And so the word you said was a combo. You've created a word and it's fabulous. That's called a spoonerism. Yes. A suzerism. So, yeah, so um, I think, I, I, yeah, so I'm excited to have this guest. I've been following her on Instagram and I feel like, you know, I felt like she would be so busy not to be, to come on our show, but here she, lo and behold, lo and behold, we, we, uh, we have we some her. good karma and got her. Got so Dawn, <laughs> without further ado. Today, our guest is Ashton Applewhite. She's a journalist, humorist, TED speaker, and anti-ageism activist who is boldly leading a grassroots movement to raise awareness of ageism and how to dismantle it. She's the author of numerous wonderfully crafted books, including the groundbreaking This Chair Rocks, A Manifesto Against Ageism. The Washington Post calls it one of the 100 best books to read at every age, and Forbes raves about it, says, one of the top 10 books to help you foster a more diverse and inclusive workspace. And you know what? It's also a great fun read. Ashton is also the co-founder of the Old School Ageism Clearinghouse, which provides free anti-ageism educational resources. And on her enlightening blog, Yo! Is This Ageist? She deftly answers questions submitted by readers about everyday instances of ageism. The Decade of Healthy Aging, a collaboration between the United Nations and the World Health Organization, recently named her one of the Healthy Aging 50, a group of leaders transforming the world to be a better place in which to grow older. Inspiring and empowering, Ashton Applewhite truly wants the world to know it's time for age pride. And we are proud to have her with us today. So please join us in welcoming Ashton Applewhite. Hello, Ashton. Hi. Hi. Hi, Ashton. So happy to have you here. So happy. I've been following your your uh, Instagram for a long time. And really, as you know, I, I reached out to you a couple of times and, and just really spoke to me and resonated so much like like it does with I'm so many other people, I'm obviously. Thank you. And um, yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. And you know, I, as you you might know, I'm doing a documentary, Don and I, called No Country for Old People. And and at the root of all this, the problems that we're having in the nursing home industry and the long-term care system is ageism. Ageism and, and ableism. And ableism, and ableism. Yeah. 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 Stigma yeah. around physical and cognitive capacity. 100%, 100%. And, you know, I witnessed it firsthand last year with my mom who had Alzheimer's for 16 years. And um, boy, was that a lethal combination, the ageism and, and uh, ableism at the very end. It was literally I could, lethal. Little, I could not save her. I couldn't. Sorry. Thank you. And, and, you know, and, and it was, it was daunting. The, like I really got a sense of what ageism is. Because it was, you know, you think about ageism. I'm in Los Angeles. I'm in the the entertainment industry, and and we know what the ageism is there, right? Yeah. And and but but you don't think about it in terms of the the healthcare system. You don't think about it in terms of of you know uh, your the quality of life that you're having, the actual quality of life, the actual uh, motivation for people to even acknowledge your existence well yeah and i would i would posit that you know you always have to zoom out and look at the systems that are in play there's a great quote by an african-american scholar named amos wilson that says if you want to understand any problem in america don't look at who suffers from it look at who profits from it you know, I so, love that quote. I right? love it. So what's yep. really going on here is is capitalism, is privatization. There's a zillion studies. There was just recently a huge one about for-profit hospices. 
Oh yeah. You know, where, where we, we have already, you know, commodified birth. Now we are commodifying death because the, you know, the, it's all being run more and more with the bottom line in mind and then zooming out in another direction. But of course it all intersects is, is capitalism reduces the value of a human being to their quote unquote productivity. Kids aren't yeah. productive, right? And they don't even right. vote. And a lot of older people are not making money anymore. So the assumption is if, you know, you must be useless, you must be a burden. It's devaluing people simply because of how old they happen to be, which is pretty vile. It's beyond vile. It's, the, it's, it's and it's deadly. It's disgusting. Yep. Yeah, no, it's exactly what my what our documentary is about is, you know, is the the profit over people, the wealth care over health care is what it is. Yeah. And, and it's 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 something that I didn't know about. It's something that the world for the most part doesn't know about until you're in it and then you're playing whack-a-mole and it's too late. It's too late. So that my goal is, and I feel like you are you are leading the way in this, is to is to, you know, to to make a a, a collective conscious conscience consciousness and conscience yes shift and how yep. we look at aging and how we look at the value of older people and how and how we've been able to desensitize ourselves and and you know as a as a population and it's not just here it's global yeah it's a, i mean it's a, it, it it's really it depends on where in the world you are. It also depends on how capitalist those societies are. And it depends on whether people of all ages live in contact with each other. But everywhere, you know, modern systems have reached, which is pretty much everywhere now, um, it's been harder for older people to remain valued members of Indeed. society. Indeed. I, I found an article about with this reporter who was you're covering this in, in Africa and Ghana and talking about how you would never see an elderly person on the streets. You would never see it because they just there was a different kind of construct of life and respect and mm -hmm. reverence. And, and, and um, they, it's now prevalent because it's become the individualistic, you know, paradigm is now moved into that, which was more of a communal paradigm. And now it's become this everywhere it's 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 permeating it may not be you know pervasive 100 percent pervasive but it's certainly certainly moving into areas where it wasn't even there before so so first i i love your book so much i watched your ted talk again last night and it's just so so inspiring and so 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 much it's so true everything about it like i get chills thinking about it because it's so true and it's so it 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 boggles my mind, and I guess I get to this age now, and I think I, I had no idea because I've never considered aging. I just consider just keep moving on. It's like one well, foot in front of the other. You know, I think it's I don't think it's all ageism. I think it's hard to imagine being old. You know, especially we age slowly. I mean, as you're when you you know, I remember being a kid and thinking like, well, why are those people just sitting in chairs? Why would you sit when you could run, right? And so on. So it's it is hard to imagine our futures as as we're as species we are not good at uh, you know americans have trouble saving you know we're, we're not good at it and we are not culturally incentivized to do so we are short-sighted you know at collectively at considerable uh cost but um but another reason we don't think about it is because we tend to think you know instantly like ooh ick it's all going to be awful the really fun thing, since it's been sort of a gloomy discussion so far, but I will say um, that if you had told me 15 years ago, I would be fascinated by aging. I would have said, ooh, why do I want to think about something sad and depressing <laughs> that old right. people do? Mm -hmm. And aging is not what old people do. Aging is a journey that we embark upon the minute we are born, right? And for a generalist like me, it connects to every aspect of being human. It connects to every domain of study from, I mean, maybe not like astrophysics, but, you know, philosophy, economics, biology, psychology. It's, it's, and, you know, you, you made me think of this because you say you don't want to think about it. We don't think about it much, but the more you think about it, the more interesting it is and the less fear it holds. 
partly because our, our fears are so huge. And I want to say very clearly, those fears are not without basis. There are real things to worry about getting sick, ending up alone, running out of money. And I, you will not hear me say, oh, just, you know, have a good attitude or eat a lot of kale, do enough sit-ups. Those things <laughs> will go bye-bye. That is not true. But we live in a culture that profits in a financial way and, and politically from those fears, right? We never hear the other side of the story. So the minute you start actually looking at aging, and please tell me if you have a different opinion, but you know, it's like uh, the scary things are still there, but holy crap, you know, all there's all these other ways in which aging enriches us and changes us and informs us. Let's tell the whole side of the, you know, the whole picture. 100%. I don't disagree with you. I I want to I was going to wait to talk about your U curve of happiness because you that touches on it, you know, which really actually but was very very um appealing to me that concept because I didn't think about that 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 actually gave me a lot of hope. No kidding. That- yeah, it's the it's the finding that people are happiest at the beginnings and the ends of their lives. Um you know, I think that as the population ages, we need to do a better job of taking care of ourselves and each other in later years, or that curve might change. Right. But it is it is true across cultures. It is true whether you are wealthy or poor. It is true whether you are married or single. So it's not just, you know, they didn't just, you know, I was so skeptical when I encountered this statistic, you know, I'm like, oh, they must have, you know, grabbed two lucky 80 year olds and given them a cookie and said, how are you doing? And it is a function of the way aging itself affects the healthy brain. And this is despite living in a society that, that, you know, has a lot of negative messages about getting older. So, you know, when I, you know, I remind my, my friends in their fifties, I say, you know, this is, this is the trough. This is where you are juggling maximum responsibilities, maximum career responsibilities, you know, teenagers driving you crazy, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things that makes midlife so hard is the presumption because of ageism that, oh, if it sucks now, it's just going to get worse. And it doesn't get worse. It gets better. I think that is the perception is that, you know, we're all going to end up, you know, infirmed, lying in a bed, you know, suffering. And according to the statistics, you show that that's not necessarily the case. Not even remotely. I mean, don't take it from me. Take it from, let's, I think most people's darkest fear is is dementia. Um, and and Alzheimer's is only one type of dementia, but it is the most common. And go, you know, to the Alzheimer's Association website, one in ten Americans, they estimate, it ends up with Alzheimer's. That's a lot of people. It's a terrible disease. Yep. But speaking of the other side of the story, you never hear that rates of Alzheimer's are declining, which they are and that people are being diagnosed at later ages. Again, not to poo-poo it, you know, there's more older people, so there are more cases, but the odds of you or me being diagnosed with Alzheimer's have gotten lower. And yes, one out of 10 is a lot of people, but if you look at a, a curve, the incidence And age is the greatest risk factor. Absolutely. Again, you know, I don't want to soft pedal that, but the older you are, the greater the risk. Most of those people are in their 80s and 90s. So the effect on most of us, most of the way is minimal, right? And our fears make us more vulnerable to exactly what we fear. I mean, this, I'll just cite one study. Uh, There's more and more data, and this, what, when I started thinking about this, I could not say ageism makes you sick. And now I can. There's all sorts of data. Um, and by the way, if you don't want to buy my book, um, I, I've been writing out loud, thinking out loud about this on my blog, thischairrocks.com slash blog. So search health, search Alzheimer's, search for Levy, because most of the research has been done by a Yale Um, psychologist and epidemiologist named Becca Levy. And one of her studies shows that people who have, she says a more positive attitude towards aging. I like to say a more accurate attitude because I don't want to ever seem to be like cherry picking the happy stuff. People with a more accurate attitude towards aging are less likely to get Alzheimer's, wait for it, 
even if they have the gene that predisposes them to the disease. And her latest study shows that it can reverse mild cognitive decline, having positive, accurate age beliefs. Reverse. She's a really cautious scientist. She That's has amazing. the data. That's so when we think, you know, if you can't find your glasses one morning and you think, oh God, you know, terror, like what if this means the early stage of dementia, that anxiety is what makes you more liable because stress is bad for us. Okay. This is so good for our audience because I'm telling you anybody that's been a caregiver for somebody with Alzheimer's, it's the scary. minute, the minute I can't think of a word, my heart goes like this. And that's just human. You know, yeah. that is human. No, I'm not dissing anyone about 20% of the population escapes cognitive decline entirely. Physical decline is inevitable. Some part of your body is going to fall apart. Most of us do experience some loss in some kinds of processing speed and capacity. The name of the movie that you saw with what's her name last week, but that's <laughs> all you lose, right? It takes us longer to find our slippers. I mean, I stand up, you know, uh, my little hack is when I realize like I've left my computer downstairs or I need to water the plow, I will stand up and name the mission. I will literally say it out loud to increase the odds that when, by the time I get to the bottom of the stairs, um, I'll remember what I went down there for. Now, I don't love having to do that. You know, I don't love having to spend longer trying to remember, but I, it comes back to me. And I know that the odds are really, 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 really excellent that I'm not going to get that ability back, but it doesn't mean I'm not going to remember what my computer is for by Thursday, right? The fear is right. bad for us. That's such a good point. You said you said in in the in your TED talk, I think it was about about you know, oh, I'm 64 and I've got a bad knee. I'm getting old. Well, your other leg doesn't have a bad knee, and it's just as old. <laughs> exactly. So it and I love that if you can frame it like that and keep positive about it, you know, because you're right. There's so much pressure to, and. I, not I even positive, just... but accurate, like accurate. Yeah, about, yeah. Right. Think about we, we all have this tendency, no judgment to blame stuff on how old we are. I'm too old for that. Well, that. <laughs> maybe your knee is too messed up. Maybe you're too lazy. Maybe you're too out of shape. Maybe you're too smart for it. Maybe you did it when you were 50 and you don't need to do it again. It's never about age. It is about physical capacity in that context. And the decline of physical capacity does uh, relate to age. It's not that age is irrelevant. It's that we have to break the habit of saying, oh, this is what young people do. This is what old people do. The whole idea Thank of you. age appropriate. If the age person age. is like over the age of consent, there's no such thing. Amen. I totally Hallelujah. believe that. <laughs> Okay, I want to sc go scooch back to the beginning now. So, because I, I, I just want to frame this for our audience. So, because so, I am, I'm grasping with this. I'm grasping how to figure out how to do this, this collective advocacy, as you said, you know, like how, how can we, because, because the nursing home crisis is so, it's broken. Our system is broken and people because of ageism don't look at it because it doesn't affect them yet. But really my mom's story is everybody's story. It's yours. It's mine. It's Dawn's. It's everybody's. It's the story of someone you care about. Absolutely. We're at one point, we're all going to be a caregiver or need a caregiver. Just that's the way it is. Right. And, and thinking of it as just an, an old people's problem, you know, aren't there old pe older people you care about, you know? Yeah. And younger, and younger people and too. And younger people you care about, right. Whose Absolutely. lives you would like not to be circumscribed by being, it's, I mean, caring for people is a beautiful, valuable, important part of being human. What makes it a burden is going it alone without support and under neoliberal capitalism. It's like, it's your problem as an individual. And it mm -hmm. shouldn't be. Of course, it's it's your problem. No one loves your mom more than you do. But it should be not just a family issue, but a social issue, right? Where we have systems. Because one of the reasons our fears are so great is because there is so little social and political support no they're right no and it's and what is is very you know it's 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 performative at best it's really it is politically and and monetarily motivated there's no oversight it's it's just really wrapped against human rights basically it's it's you know for to be crude about it there we're warehousing our our vulnerable 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, these are human rights and human rights should not expire with time. Yeah. yeah. Indeed. Can capitalism so- and, and care coincide? Is it possible for capitalism oh. and care to, to act, to work together where? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If we, I mean, it would mean that court, that we would have to choose um, and put po- and enact policy that that has a priority other than corporate profits. You know, so that's, I mean, I mean, don't get me started on the colossal benefits. I mean, just even with, you know, with to oil companies, despite the fact that the, the you know, the planet is frying and they are making colossal profits still rather than putting any money into corrective measures or you know these the people who own the the, you know hospitals and hospices they're making buckets of dough if they made less money we're we're not you know then yes that money could be diverted it's doable but we need the political will and we need the political mechanisms the political mechanism is not going to happen until the people stand up and demand it because Absolutely. right now it's too it's too advantageous and and there's no they're not incentivized at all to make any changes because it that it, it's basically they're just you know CMS don't get me started cuz be there there's like there's zero oversight they're handing the money to the foxes who are what, looking at the chickens and they're going here you go go on in rent a room there you nothing know. changes except by the unless people literally get in the streets and demand it That's that it. is literally what, that is what compels um social change laws don't shape behavior behavior shapes legislation behavior forces policy and legislation and listen to that listen to that my friends because that is so true right don that that's and we've brilliant. seen it and it and we've seen it done before and we have. there's no reason it can't be done now yeah. and but everyone, not, but people not, have i just to read a, a great quote in the context of uh of patriarchy with a lot of all the discussion that the Barbie movie has people talking about patriarchy, which regardless of what you thought of the movie is fantastic because it's for it's, it's it, people, when people talk about patriarchy, they are zooming out and looking at the system that oppresses all women. Right. You know, yes. and that's, that's so important. You know, there are systems here that we need to recognize so that we don't get squabbling about about smaller things and who has a better, you know, piece of the pie or worse deal or whatever. We need to join forces across difference to force, to build coalitions and compel change. And patriarchy can also, you know, we, we it shouldn't be so tied to gender. Patriarchy is now a much bigger. Well, patriarchy <laughs> bigger is thing. bad for yeah. men too. The yeah. quotes I I spaced and forgot the quote. The patriarchy, you know, can't want a woman said. Can can we change patriarchy? And you know, and the answer was, people created these systems and people can change them. That's right. You know, Did they you? are they are you know sociology speak. They are socially constructed. You know, like race is a social construction. It is not biology. You know, there is not, they're not the, the patriarchy piece running around, but of course, women are complicit in patriarchy too. We're brainwashed. We're all complicit in ageism. We all grow up surrounded by these systems. And the first and hardest step is to look at our own, our own perceptions of these systems and our own bias and the way in which we contribute to them and need to, you know, re, re align ourselves. That is hard. That is unpleasant. The good news is that the next step and the next step, there's nothing automatic about understanding, you're acknowledging that you are biased, which we all are. And it's not a fun realization. The next step is fantastic because it happens automatically. It's like letting a genie out of the bottle. Once you start to see ageism in the culture around you or patriarchy in the culture around you, boom, you start to see it everywhere, right? That's what consciousness raising does. You start to see like, oh, it's not because I'm too, f- fill in the blank, too, you know, t- too um, unwell, too bossy, too whatever. There too are blonde. systems. Too blonde. Yeah, you're too blonde, too, <laughs> I mean, with women, you know, too smart oh. or too quiet, too old or too young. You're never, you're never the right thing. Uh-huh. And so it's not about you, it's about systems that profit from our divisions. 
Exactly. Exactly. Did I'm mean, off? To, just, just pivot a second. Did you did you see the Barbie movie? I did. Did what do you think? I loved it. Me too. Amen. We Good. did. Yes, we absolutely. did too. I thought that <laughs> I thought that America Ferrara's monologue, which just kicked ass, that you know, I thought that you might like it after listening to what you you're yeah. reading, what yeah. you wrote. I mean, she. It's about the contradictions of being. A woman. And I just, you know, from a nerdier perspective, the Harvard Business Review just published a piece about women in leadership positions, talking about why there are so few. Good news, there's always a reason why women are not promoted. You were either too single, too divorced, or too married. You are too sexy or not sexy enough. You are too assertive <laughs> so uh, and annoy people, or you're not assertive enough, therefore can't possibly be a leader. And there's no age wise, there's no sweet spot. Fertility wise, there's no sweet spot. Men get a promotion if they're going to become fathers. Women get sidelined because of patriarchy and capitalism. The gender wage gap benefits the bottom line. It works for corporations if women are competing for two seats at the table instead of insisting on a crack at all 10 of them. And then what it does is it pits women against women. That's what mm-hmm. I grew up with, mm-hmm. you know, pitting women against women. So, I mean, I did a whole, I did a documentary for the Writers Guild a couple of years ago, just about that, you know, about. Right. Stay at home moms arguing with moms in the paid workforce about who's a better mom instead of coming together right. to force, um, you know, collective actions to close the gender wage gap so women could choose right or not to stay so while the guys are having their boys club and just climbing up the you know failing upwards we we're you know we're trying to break the glass ceiling at every chance we can get and and as soon as one woman does they they're you know they're they're blocking it back up they're taping it back up because they're hopefully not and but that's yeah yeah but i i hear you i know you're not i uh i hear you and i just want to put in, make the point that as white women, much of mainstream white feminism has benefited other white women and at the expense of women with disabilities, of women of color, and that we really need to be conscious that the changes that we want to see are done in consultation and and collaboration with women who don't look like us, who may have ideas that don't make sense to us or that we don't Mm -hmm. agree with, but they are, that doesn't make them wrong or not legitimate. And in fact, you know, they may, it makes them especially important because they're missing from the conversation. We need to be aware of that because, uh, you know, if, if those women, women with less privilege do not enjoy equity, none of us are free. Agreed. I mean, I feel like in our, in our, in, at least in my little, uh, social, you know, in my workforce, it's, there is a big shift. And, and yeah, there's a very, very big conscious F conscious. It's been going on for, I want to say the last four years where women of color, women of disability are really coming into their own power. Fantastic. And, and, and it, it is, it's evidenced by the kinds of content that we have by the, by the leadership of women is being really, it, it is, it is a really, don't you agree, Don? It's very No, I strong. think you definitely, yeah, it, it, you see it more and more literally every day. Um, Mm -hmm. and then, then you get into the issue and this is all, you know, the same thing about, uh, you know, well, wait, now we're going too too far that way. So the other, like, (laughs) you know, people like Susie doesn't have a chance now because now it's all going, you know, and that's all. It's true. It's true. And and we've talked about that. We've (laughs) talked, we talk about that all the time. It's not zero sum. No, no. (laughs) You know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was asked how many women she thought should be on the Supreme court. And she said nine. (laughs) <laughs> you know which she didn't mean it should right needs to be all women but women need to think why are we thinking in terms of the traditional share that's gone to women or even 50 percent? men don't men don't think that way because they Never. don't have to because and they're not they're not um they're not used to doing so because the system doesn't compel them to think that way right and and so but those systems are not good for anyone you know patriarchy is why we have toxic masculinity and men who are you know unable to be vulnerable publicly and incels you know at the most radical end you know you know literally shooting women because they're you know not they should be able to you know have all the power 
and they resent right. when it, but you know, all this, the pushback that you mentioned is a sign that we are getting somewhere, you know, to hear people talk, me too was a failure. Black lives matter is over. Occupy was a flop. I disagree. I think those me ideas too. are living on powerfully in the culture. Agreed. And you know, it's incredibly demoralizing to see the pushback on women's rights. Let's pass the equal rights amendment. How about that one? Um, but the fact that there's pushback is a sign that these movements are beginning to threaten actual power structures. Mm -hmm. I agree with and you. And I think, yeah, and it's and it can be incremental in that even like with our documentary, we're like, you know, when we know when, when this is over, we are not going to solve the entire problem. But if you can chip away and chip it away. literally goes chip, chip, chip. And we said, even if, look, if we if we make two people's lives better, that's better. I completely agree. We, yeah. uh, I'm, uh, I am a co-founder of a site called Old School, which I will just say is the, it's hundreds of free vetted resources to educate people about ageism, oldschool.info. And we have a weekly meetup. Anyone can join, go to oldschool.info and find out how. It's easy. Um, but we end each meeting with it's, it, you know, it's no step is too small. No step is too late. We are not going to end ageism. We are not going to end racism. But a, a formulation that I find really helpful is that, you know, it can seem, I, and I don't like to talk in terms of ending it, you know, we're, we're helping to end it. We're moving the needle. Yeah. And it can feel like a really heavy load when you realize that that you know these systems depend on each other and reinforce each other right this idea of intersectionality of this you know weight layer of weights but just exactly what you just said don that when we chip away at any form of prejudice we chip away at the fear and ignorance that underlie them all when you are being anti-racist you are helping end ageism you are making life better for older people of color. When you chip away at ageism, you are helping everyone because all people who are lucky, right? And aging lucky. should not yep. be a privilege. It should be a right, but it's not because of all these forms of oppression. We're working constantly with the littlest movements to 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 undermine them all. So it's not zero sum. You know that activism is uh, you know is is intersectional also. Yes. I, I love that. Yeah. And I get never to, too and, small. Thank you to remind <laughs> me that because, you know, in this in this world where we're living right now in the world of, of healthcare, and and you realize that every second that goes by someone's suffering because of the of this this system that we have created, which really you have to blame it on ageism, because if the if everyone in the public knew what was going on and really knew I mean, we put, we give more we give more grace to pets and children oh, yeah. and prisoners, and yet we've got people warehoused and they're they're suffering. It's torture, what's going on? Yeah. And I'm not I'm yeah. not exaggerating. I mean, it really is. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to say we we treat prisoners better, but I, rather than getting into an argument about that, which I know you're you're with me on this, let's look at the same forces that profit from the prison industrial complex. You yeah. know, they are related, which is why the umbrella of capitalism is so useful. Yeah, you're, you're right. You're right. So what are the roots of ageism? Just give us a couple. What do you what where does it all come from? Um, well, it, you know, it comes from the culture around us. And I think, um, you know, we already touched on the fact that it's hard to imagine growing old. Longevity, this longevity is new. You know, humans in the last hundred years are living everywhere longer than ever before. When people, life expectancy, average life expectancy in the U.S. at the turn of the 20th century was, I think, 47. So there's a lot more oldness. Um, and in the 20th century, it started to be conceived of as a problem to be solved which is when retirement villages came into being. It's when nursing homes came into being. Um, it's when social security came into being, which has lifted millions and millions of Americans out of poverty, but it also othered older people yeah. and it made it easier to conceive of us as a problem, as an economic burden. So, you know, the answers to all these things are, are really, really complex. I mean, 
longevity represents a triumph of public health. Again, the, the issues are real, you know, because of ableism, because of the loss of physical and cognitive capacity, which is not synonymous with aging. Lots of older people are sharp as a whip and active to the end, but they do relate, right? And because of that, an older population is going to require supports, and that's complicated. And the extreme end of the supports that they need is exactly the subject of your important work and your documentary, right? So we, we need to acknowledge those things, but we need to um, we need to understand where the fears come from and what purpose they serve. And, you know, ableism, which is a stigma and prejudice around physical or cognitive capacity, you know, I think most of what we think of as ageism, most of our apprehension about getting older is about that loss. Mm -hmm. And that is not actually, again, it's related to age, but lots of younger people have disabilities. Lots of older people do not. And we need to understand what they are, where they're different, how they overlap, how they mm -hmm. inform each other in order to understand what we're up against. Coalition building, think. There, there's a fantastic disability justice movement, mostly led by young queer women of color who identify proudly as disabled, who are doing all sorts of amazing work. You know, think what we olders who are aging into disability could learn from them about adapting and identifying and you know they could learn a thing or two from us right yeah instead of just going ew i may be old but at least i'm not disabled and from the other end ew, it may dis be disabled but at least i'm not old you know that's a whole little thing like people not wanting to use canes and walkers because it makes them look old and by the way most of those people are 60 70 and 80 they don't want to go to a you know senior joint because it's full of old people old people yeah yeah well, can't have that, that, was, that. p.s yeah. you're one of them. yes exactly mm -hmm. right exactly. i mean a huge tell is how many people who have more road behind them than ahead still talk about older people as them right mm -hmm. and as yeah. long you know ageism is a, is a distancing from your own future older self and it is not healthy to go through life you know, in, in that, with that kind of distance. Is old kind of a four threat. letter word? Is, is old a four? Is it something that we should just banish from our vocabulary no, or no. is it, what, tell us about, is, is old I mean, bad? Well, no, <laughs> things are old. Antiques are yeah. old. We love, yeah. you know, old, Europe's old. We love that shit. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, <laughs> what's a problem is the negative connotation attached to yeah. old. I mean, if you think about um, Dyke, right? Or queer. Those used to be deep pejoratives and they were appropriated by the gay community and gay women as, you know, and, and a crip is another one that many people with disabilities now identify with proudly. If, you know, I'm old, I don't have a problem saying that, but it took me a long time to get there. If you don't want to call yourself old, no judgment. We each need to do this in our own way at our own time, but it shouldn't be pejorative it should be just another word like you know indonesian or you know uh vegetarian maybe, that is maybe a we part need another of our pronoun. identity and maybe we need another <laughs> pronoun like they or no, you know maybe we need to say young or old we're just a person and we're I, in I mean, a, we're on yeah. a journey ideally I, we embrace it but honestly the world i want is not it is a world in which age is neutral right it's there it's a crucial part of our identity but it doesn't have any value attached to it. It has information, but not value. And just one point about the information, the older we age at different rates, right? In each one of us, in the sense we're socially at some level, psychologically another, physically another, developmentally. So, and each of those is sort of a variable component of in each of us. So the older the person, the less, their age, their chronological age says about them. The, the, you know, gerontologists, geriatricians who are, you know, doctors for old people say, and I've heard them say it, if you've seen one octogenarian, you've seen one octogenarian. There could be, it's, a, you know, this whole argument about whether you're too old to run for office. You know, the, the health profile of a single 
80 year old, especially if you are a well-off white man who has the best, you know, health care and fitness and diet available to them says nothing, you know, about um, the likely, you know, the health status of another. So I want a world where age is not just a number. We can't dismiss it. We shouldn't wish to put it under the rug, but where it's stripped of any uh, positive or negative connotation. It's okay. like what kind of car you just, drive, where you live, is. who you sleep with. It's part of who we are. Uh, we yeah. shouldn't and be discriminated against it and we shouldn't be put on a pedestal or dumped in a, a nursing home. Well, we and are, by and the way, sorry, yes, one more thing, okay. <laughs> but people don't end up in nursing homes because they're old. They end up in nursing homes because they're disabled. So y'all could do some really, really interesting advocacy around that because people who think, institutional care is fine for old people, but not okay for young people, right, are being ageist. And we, it's the same cause. No one at any age should be dumped in a shitty institution. We do, they do, if you need, you know, professional nursing care, you need a facility that can provide it, right? But it shouldn't be, you know, understaffed and all those things. You know this right. already. But right. think no, about it, how you yeah. might build coalitions with the disability justice movement around the deinstitutionalization, which we saw a lot of in the 20th century, you know, of, of people with disabilities living in community. Where is that ethos when it comes to older people? Because age should not disqualify you from that ethical standard. Right. Right. We, and, and I think that come, and I agree with you a hundred percent. We, we, we interviewed people that are in of different ages in, in nursing homes to, so that we can make that point, but, but, but still in all, and I always talk about it on our show about, you know, Benjamin Button, which is my greatest uh, reference is that, you know, we, we, you know, children, babies don't have language for sometimes for two and a half, three years. They don't use words. They don't articulate, but they certainly, they certainly communicate and we give them grace and we communicate with them yeah. and we can, we can, we know when they're happy. We know when they're sad. We know when they're mad for sure. We know <laughs> all they're hungry and, and, and in discomfort. Well, that's the same with someone who's lost their ability to, to articulate, you know, physically. They yeah, are and still, we, Yeah. Another study uh, of Becca Levy, she coined the term elder speak, which is mm -hmm. that sort of derogatory, condescending, oh, honey, it can be benevolent in intent, but it's still condescending and not okay that even people with profound dementia grew more agitated when people spoke condescendingly. A hundred percent. And the education in our, in our world, you know, in terms of that, in terms of aging, in terms of what you just said is, is so deficient because the, even the people working within the industry are so undereducated, you know, I mean, I and had, they can, yeah. they can be there often. It was a huge surprise to me, you know, when I, cause I came to this with no background in the field whatsoever. And when I sort of you know, drank the Kool-Aid and went, gee, we really need to call out ageism. That was before I understood that ableism was also a big piece of it. They're going to be so happy to hear from me. Well, not so much because, and I'd say this with no disrespect at all, the work that people do in nursing homes and other, you know, institutional settings, care in general is incredibly important and incredibly undervalued. And it mm -hmm. is hard. Mm -hmm. And and it is really hard and, you know, caring for the people at the most debilitated end of the spectrum. And it is really, really hard to reconcile that piece of getting old with what you hope lies ahead for yourself. You know, that's a tough psychic task. And, uh, you know, I respect that they are embarked on it and doing the best they can. Absolutely. We just need to give them the support that they need too, which they're not and getting. And education. Yeah. And education. Mm -hmm. So we have, we had a huge exodus of, of, you know, frontline workers and providers who just can't deal with it because there's moral injury. They can't do the job they want to do. And so they're not being paid. There's not enough benefits. They're being disrespected and they're being overworked because, you know, that's where they cut corners on, on cost. Is, is Agree. Employees. Agree. And that's why the work is, you know, done by so much of it by women, so many of which are not, you know, registered citizens yep. who are ripe for exploitations. I mean, you know all this already, but it's yeah. the, the reason so many older people died in institutional care was because 
care workers had to have several jobs in order to put food on the table for their kids. So they unintentionally became vectors for the COVID virus. We could talk for 17 hours and I love, I, mean, I, know, I have forever. a list of stuff that we didn't even get to, but I don't care. I like it's always you. the I, way. I love you so much. You are my, <laughs> you're my queen. You are, you are speaking so well for us. And I, I'm so proud to know you and I'm so proud of the work you're doing. So thank you. You so, so, so much. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you for making this movie. Making it documentary is hard, you know, so. Indeed. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Good All luck right. to you. Okay. Have a great day. Okay. Take care. Take care. Well, that was an um, amazing interview. I love that woman. And um, I hope that everyone got a lot out of it because I got so much out of it. And if you, if, if you didn't get enough of her on this podcast, do go and watch her TED Talk listen to her TED talk. It's so good. It's so invigorating and, and um, smart. Well, it, and- it's amazing how she changes your, like the way she speaks, she changes your perspective and changing that perspective is everything. You know, yeah. when she's talking about, you know, one out of 10 people may get to, uh, Alzheimer's. Well, if you look at it as nine out of 10 won't, <laughs> that sounds, a lot, I mean, that that kind of takes some of that worry away. And she said that worry is what leads or can help lead to that. You know, so yeah. if, nine out of, if nine out of 10 adults are worrying about being the one out of 10, you know, then, I mean, it, so it's just changing that viewpoint is, is amazing and everything. And she does it in a way that you just see it right away. I agree. I think that how how we view ourselves is always going to be is always going to I- impact how we feel how we how productive we are how what we put out into the world and what we attract right mm-hmm. so if we are feeling negative we're going to attract negativity we're going to attract we may get, you know it, that it, we know that our fi- that our mental state is how it, it always affects our physical state that's that's just a given so if we're going to stress and lament about some construct that doesn't even relate to us about aging that's just shooting ourselves in the foot yeah yeah exactly i'll be doing I mean, hip-hop it, till the day i die that's yeah. the way it goes i the you thinking, know don't yeah, the shoot thinking my neg- the, <laughs> the thinking negativity is doing the thing it's creating the thing you're worried about it's that that negativity right. it's yeah i mean it's, it's self-fulfilling to, prophecy exactly it's self- Right. Exactly. I mean, yeah, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's like it's like in any relationship, if you're worried about that person leaving you, well, you're going to you're going to worry them out the door. Yeah, I got to push them right out. You're going to push them <laughs> right out. So there you go. There's our there's our profound words of the day from Dawn and Susie. So brilliant. You're Gosh, welcome. We are terrific. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> but that's because we love you. And that's because love is powerful. Love is contagious and love conquers all. So we so appreciate you watching, listening. Uh, Please subscribe. Also, Susan, we're working on something pretty important and that is No Country for Old People. And uh, we're still looking for that that push to get us over the edge. So if you you wanna be part of our movement, uh, please go to our GoFundMe. And help support the production of this um, very, very important film. See you next time. Hey, this is Susie Singer Carter, and I just wanted to take a minute to talk to you about bed sores. I know, but if you're like I was, you probably don't have a clue what a bed sore really is. Most people don't. I mean, no one told me, and I I really just assumed it was part of the body that was like the name says, sore from laying in one position too long. And if you change the position, all better. Wrong. Bed sore is really a euphemism for more appropriate names, such as pressure wound and decubitus ulcer. Unfortunately, I discovered what a bed sore really was when my mom was admitted into the hospital last year with a stage four ulcer. That is the worst level. You don't ever want that to happen. Bed sores can develop quickly and worsen rapidly and can lead to serious health issues even death. If they're not properly treated or properly treated, and that includes cleaning and dressing the wound, but most importantly, reducing pressure off the sore by frequently changing the position of the person off of their wound so it can heal. And that can mean propping the person up 30 degrees to the side, far enough to be off the lower back, 
but not too far as to be on the side hip where there isn't much cushion, right, between the skin and the bone. This is why I'm so excited to tell you about Bedsore Rescue, which was designed by an amazing woman, Gwen Jewell, a nurse who was tired of fooling around with simple pillows and bulky wedges that just don't work. The Bedsore Rescue positioning wedge cushions are uniquely designed to provide ergonomically correct and comfortable support for a sustained period of time without touching the sore. And the curvatures and bilateral angles make it possible for the bedsore cushion to be used to support many other body parts as well. You can float the heels, you can put it under the head, you can put it under the arms, behind the knees, both sides. You can even use it as a breakfast and bed table. The curvatures of the bedsore rescue fit the curvatures of your person's body and it's made to meet all the patient safeties and bed bound positioning standards for acute and long-term care facilities. I wish I had it for my mom. I really do. So chances are, if you have a loved one in a long-term care facility or at your home, you may become a pressure injury soldier too. But bed sores should never, never get to stage four. And one way to ensure that they don't is to make sure that as soon as one begins to develop, you keep the pressure off. You can do that easily with Bed Sore Rescue. And you can find Bed Sore Rescue and many other pressure solutions online at Jewel Nursing Solutions, home of the patented Bed Sore Rescue positioning wedge cushions, pads, and pillows. That's Jewel, J E W E L L, nursing solutions.com. And when you use the special code and C F O P, the entire amount of your purchase will go to support our important documentary, No Country for Old People, which chronicles my mother's journey navigating the nursing home long-term care crisis that literally began with an unreported, untreated pressure wound. So take the pressure off yourself and your loved one with the Bedsore Rescue.